anxiety is a huge problem and it's everywhere, right? Everybody is talking about, well, I'm, I've got anxiety about these things. And it's like, do we believe that God is a ruler of men and who prospers the way of his servants? Do we trust mm-hmm. that God is faithful and that he blesses for a thousand generations? Do we hold that true? Welcome to Scalay Sisters, where we are cultivating the maximum number of thinking moms we can. This is the podcast for classical homeschooling mamas who yearn for something more than just checking boxes and getting it all done. Scalay Sisters discusses topics that matter to those of us who believe that educating ourselves through reading widely, thinking deeply, and applying faithfully equips us for the task of educating our children. I'm your host, Brandi Benzel. To get my free, almost weekly, mostly Charlotte Mason newsletter, go to afterthoughtsblog.net slash subscribe and sign up. My co-hosts today are Misty Winkler and Abby Wall. Misty is a homeschooling mom of five, including two graduates. She writes and podcasts at simplyconvivial.com and is the author of two excellent books, The Convivial Homeschool and Simplified Organization. Abby is basically the queen of the Scully sistership. Abby is a country living farmer, rancher, a loving wife, and mom of five who homeschools and reads whenever she can. Are you ready? The live kickoff for our newest Scully Sisters mentorship will take place on Friday, October 18th at 1.30 p.m. Pacific Time. Our mentorships are for Sophie level sistership members. However, our kickoff is for everyone, even those of you on our free plan. If you are not yet in the sistership but want to participate in the live kickoff for the mentorship, which we've named Stable and Steadfast, Standing on Your God-Given Rights, go to scolysisters.com slash join and sign up. Today's episode is the fourth in our series exploring Charlotte Mason's chapters on habits from her book, School Education. And so Misty, Abby, and I discuss one of the most off-limit topics, religion. You're going to love this conversation. And so without further ado, let's get to it. Let's start off with our school every day. Who would like to go first? I would love to go first. This is Abby. And I'm probably going to be bringing this up in our school every day all the time, but I am teaching a literature class to (laughs) high school students in my church (laughs) co-op. And it is so fun. We started with Pinocchio. And you may be thinking Pinocchio in a high school literature class. But, you know, we have a wide variety of educational philosophy backgrounds and not one of the kids had read it. And I know I had read it with my older kids, but I don't think my twins, I think they were too young to remember it. In any case, we we read this book and we were delighted. It was mm. so funny. We absolutely thought Pinocchio was the worst. <laughs> and it has been so much fun. We've been laying on the couch and I've been reading it aloud and the boys have been going through and marking similes and metaphors. And that's why I used it is because it, I thought it would be a great one for teaching them literary devices, right? Mm. Because the content isn't hard to understand, but there's so many things like foreshadowing and symbolism and, you know, all of these fun things. And we had to teach some of these kids how to annotate their books and underline and highlight. And so everybody had to have their own copy. So the boys and I are laying there and I'm on the couch and I'm reading to them and they're copying along. And my husband comes in and he goes, are you just so proud of yourself right now? Because one of the twins was like, wait a minute, I need to go back. Here's where they said luck. And now they're bringing it back. And I feel like this is just perfect, you know, connection and (laughs) He just looks at me, you know, kind of like, are you just so proud of yourself right now? Because like, this is, <laughs> this is like the dream right here is that people were reading literature, we're excited about things and we're finding, you know, treasures in the, the words of literature. And nice. I was like, yes, yes, I am right now. This is, <laughs> this is a very happy moment 
in high school that I'm just so happy about. So yes, I didn't make everyone get the same translation. I thought, oh, they'll be close enough. You know, I was just like, just don't get an abridged version. So different. And that was my mistake because I got Oxford World Classics for my family. And then most of the other ones had like a better cartoon kind of character on the front. And it was an unabridged. But when we were reading it aloud, we compared the two. And one was so much richer in language and metaphor. A lot of them had the similes, but the metaphors in the Oxford World Classics were excellent. Hmm. And then some kids brought another version and it was just so terrible. I ended up, I had another copy because I had found some at like the St. Betty's. And so I was like, no, here, you need to have this copy and, Hmm. you know, do this. And so it is just, it's really important to get a good translation, but I wouldn't have known had we not compared. And the other one wasn't bad, but we we would have one of my twins read along in that one and we're like, okay, what does that one say? And he would say it and we're like, oh, that's so lame. It's just so just <laughs> dead language. And it was like, oh, we enjoyed it so much more because of, you know, some of the language choices. Mm. But they commonplaced out of there. They kept finding, you know, delightful things. Instead of me giving all of the like quiz questions and all that, because I don't really actually enjoy that as a homeschooler. I don't like making tests. And, you know, so I've had the kids come up with questions from their reading and then they put them on a note card and then we go around and I have each of them ask about it. And I give them a little bit of ideas about what I'm looking for. But one girl said, this is the question she came up with. How does Pinocchio acknowledge his own sin? Does he actually change and grow? And I just thought that wow. was really great because, you know, we're talking about these things. And I thought, oh, that's so wonderful. And then they gave like everybody kind of who was took that kind of question. They found evidence of him fight him repenting, but then not following through. And like it was it was a really good discussion. So I just I found it to be really great, even in the high school level, that these kids are thinking very deeply about, you know, the ideas. I have to say. That is even in Charlotte Mason's other uses of books. She talks oh, about having hmm. a, creating a list of questions that, that you know, that they intend to yeah. ask of themselves, basically. Anyway, that's interesting to me. I, I have never seen that in action in a group setting. So that's really cool. Yeah, I've, that's what I've just decided that I'm going to do because um, they're, the, they're the ones supposed to be doing the work and the learning. But I yeah. feel like... Pulling together test questions is a lot of work for me. So mostly it's out of laziness, but it gets them thinking about things differently. And, you know. Yeah, I, I just skip tests entirely. So yeah, that's yeah. a great idea. <laughs> I'm putting work on them. That's great. What about you, Misty? Well, I just started a new book. I was looking over... Well, I have finished books. Maybe I should bring a book I finished, but I finished a bunch of books really fast for the attention retreat. Mm. And really, honestly, none of this was worth bringing here. Really, <laughs> yeah, but I started another one a few days ago. I'm like, well, maybe I'll just like listen to this one while I'm preparing. And I'm like, nope, I am just done with this genre that is actually so little content in so many words. <laughs> The self-help The self-help. Yeah. Yeah. Productivity mind stuff. It's like, okay, I really don't care about your personal story. Did you write a report? Oh, Oh. it's like cooking blogs. Yes. Yes. It's like, just take me to the recipe. (laughs) I saw the most hilarious meme the other day. They said, if you could put government secrets in the narrative story part of recipe blogs, no one would ever find them. (laughs) <laughs> <That's hilarious. laughs> so i said i need a break i need something different and i thought well you know really i probably should read fiction to get a break yeah. with the projects that we have on our plate right now i can't let myself get into story grip yeah sure it, and I wasn't able really to dive back into my theology 
re- I haven't finished my systematic theology book for the year. I still have time. I still will. And I am reading Calvin again this year with school. So like, anyway, I started a book that a friend recommended called Hannah's Children. Oh, I've seen that. Yeah. Hannah's Children, the stories of women quietly defying the birth dearth mm-hmm. by Catherine Akaluk. Yeah, sounds uh, right. I don't know if I'm s- pronouncing that right, but so it's, you know, it's, it's still journalistic storytelling, but I really like her style and I feel like she's saying meaty things even as she's weaving things together. I'm just in chapter four and they're fairly short-ish chapters. And so, so far she's like defended a little bit her approach and exp- she did share her personal story of like what got her on this track. But it was not a self-indulgent telling of her story. It was Mm. very straightforward. And she has eight children. And this study is combined. I don't remember now which university, but she said it was a Catholic university partnering with Brigham Young, so the Mormons, to put together this study of... Women in it's like eight different regions. Her first story, which I'm in the middle of right now, her first interview, which is with Hannah, the so it's the main character, if you will, hmm. is in Israel. They haven't quite set up the whole backstory, but I think that she's an American Jew hmm. that became more devout and like returned to her religion as an adult and then she and her husband moved back to israel that's i don't quote me on that because i am only halfway through but that's where it sounds like it's going and so it's not like ignoring the faith element but it's also not necessarily emphasizing it either interesting it's studying the reasons behind women choosing to have five or more children. So she, I just got to the point where she, her criteria are five or more. Which oh, when I, I didn't was, make the cut. I know. Ha ha. Ha ha. Hey, <laughs> was it was a lack of effort. That's right. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, but so my friend that read it first and was telling me about it, uh, she also has five. And she was saying that really, you know, big family, and and my friend and I have had this discussion before, we both think that really big family starts at six. Like, we Mm -hmm. we don't really count. We don't count. I count (laughs) myself. I had two at once. So (laughs) that's true. I don't know. Yeah. You had a lot, a lot of children all at once. Yeah. Yeah. So right now she's pointed out that economics currently is treating how the choices about how many children a household has as if children were consumable goods like it's a statistic yep. that they're measuring as a oh if you if you want one you'll have what kind of like oh it's the demand basically it's a chanel bag <laughs> yeah exactly and and she's saying maybe that's it's possibly true for a large segment of the population, but children shouldn't be viewed like that. Mm. And they are not viewed by that. They are not viewed or treated like that in families that choose to focus on family and having children. And so anyway, I still am just in the setup part of it, but She's kind of defending a different take on economics away from just statistic models into deriving theory from stories, personal stories. Interesting. Interesting. I was at I was at book club this last week and we were talking about parents of onlys and we have a friend who has an only child, but she was much older when she had a child because she got married later, you know, just mm-hmm. not by mm-hmm choice right and 
our other friend just said, well, she said, when I know somebody really well, and I know it will come across as a joke and not, you know, <laughs> rude or whatever, she says, I'd call my friends with only children, hobby parents. <laughs> <laughs> So that just reminded uh, me of your economic, like, well, you can have one. Well, you can have a hobby. So anyway. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I grew up the oldest of seven and learned how to drive on a 15 passenger van. Uh, my dad would say minivans are for mini families. <laughs> <laughs> she is explaining how the at first, like there was a huge drop in birth rate with birth control, contraception becoming widely available and acceptable. and But that first drop corresponded to a desire to put a lot of time and money into each individual child. Mm -hmm. But the birth rate continued to fall after that. So it was people, they basically assumed themselves to be fertile. And then added contraception after, like, okay, now let's just, like, this is our family. Let's really, you know, quote unquote, pour into just this small family. And then after that, the birth rate continued to fall until it became more like, okay, here, I am my own person. I am myself. And how do kids fit into my identity and my life that I have set up for myself? And that what we have now is the assumption of contraception. Like that's the base, basically barrenness, the opposite of a fertility, right? So you start off making yourself barren and then you choose whether or not to be fertile if you want to. Yeah. Well, I think especially in the Pacific Northwest, I think our birth rate is way, even less than a lot of other places in the country. Yeah. Um, and I know that Seattle has more dogs per capita. Like, I mean. Yeah. More dogs than kids. More dogs than kids. Um, in my yep. own hometown, we have one store that has, like, is an actual children's store. And then there's like, you know, a couple little ones that have maybe a tiny kid section or whatever. But there's like six or seven pet stores. And not just like <laughs> agricultural stores, but like wow. pet stores. Yeah. And yep. I mean, there's so many people that are just not having children. Yeah. I forget when she wrote this or what. Oh, it is actually it just came out this year. Yeah. So I think it was 2020 statistics. She was saying the current American birth rate is 1.6. Mm. Uh, that's the lowest it's ever been, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, that's by a lot. Because really we always bad. had a higher than a lot of industrialized countries. Anyway, I thought. I'm curious, does she talk at all about the effect of environmentalism on these choices? Do you mean as a philosophy? Like the yeah, mindset of so preserving basically the like earth. Progress, pres progressives? I like mean, liberals? Sort of, yeah, yeah. Uh, zero, sort of, but I'd say like specifically, yeah. The, I, I think it's specifically because I mean, it's not like every progressive doesn't have children. Yeah. But there's definitely. A well, okay. So here's where where this question is coming from. So my parents in the seventies were highly influenced by this whole like we're going to reach the maximum population, right? And everything's going to. I mean, so like they and their friends pretty much all had two children, except for a few people who ended up with bonus babies when they were like forty. So then they had three, right? But I mean, it was like it was just the little standard thing. But if when I talked to them. When I was older and knew to ask questions about these things, I found out that there were basically two situations. There were people who just were infertile, and this was all that all that they could have was what they had. And then the other people were like, yeah, we were basically told that, you know, like to be responsible, it was irresponsible to have more than two because the world can't handle it. Mm -hmm. And so my parents, I mean, told me more than one time they wish they had had more children. Yeah, my father-in-law, he, my husband's the oldest of seven also, and people, a lot of their peers and people that they went to church with and everything, they said, you know, 
they only had two kids and they have often come back to my father-in-law and he says it's always just stuck in his mind that they said, I wish we would have been more like you and had more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they felt guilty doing it. And that's, I, I think there's a change now because I think there's this mentality, at least among some of the world is so bad. Why would I bring children into it? Mm -hmm. Like it's a hopelessness. Yeah. And they do mean a type of environmental fatalism. Like when you really talk about what's so bad, it's like toxicity and polluted air and polluted water and blah, blah, blah. And th like there's other people who think the world is bad that still have kids. Like it's a very specific type of concern. But it's this view that mankind is not part of nature, but is a plague upon the earth. Therefore, mm -hmm. he yeah. doesn't really have a right to be here. Yeah. I think... I'm going to guess mm -hmm. that she might bring that up to contrast, mm. but her primary goal here is going to be to show what the people who do have children are thinking. Oh, interesting. And okay. like why they are choosing. So the, obviously by looking at the birth rate, the norm is to not have kids or to have one or two. And so she is going and investigating reasons why women choose large families interesting well that sounds cool yeah 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 it's it's been on my radar for a while and i just i just knew i didn't have time <laughs> so <laughs> right now she is setting up a corollary in, with politics so i don't know where she's gonna take uh, that oh that you you had brandy at politics yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> i'm gonna download it right now <laughs> she said <laughs> I think it was the 2000 election was the first time that someone did a study that noticed that the, I mean, basically it's city to rural, but it, that's also the same pretty much as no or few kids to like four or more kids oh. is, is city to suburb, you know, hmm. and that those are very much red or blue. They, those correlate. Okay. Hmm. And so they they noticed that and then they thought, well, maybe that was just, you know, post Clinton back to family kind of thing. But then it held true for was Obama next? I don't care. My presidents are out. <laughs> like I this is my within my adulthood. So I should know this. <laughs> <laughs> but it held it true in two thousand eight as well. And then yeah, so two thousand eight was Obama. Yeah. yeah. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> so they went back and studied it and the size of family plus where in relation to cities plus voting Republican or Democrat converged or like that trend began in the mid 90s and has continued until today. So interesting. Yeah. So I don't know where they're going to where she's going to take that. That was the beginning of the chapter I'm in. All right. So anyway, it's 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 well written. It's been enjoyable to listen oh, to. Okay, okay, cool. Well, mine is one I've talked about before, so I'm not going to talk for a long time about it. But it's in tune with the world by Joseph Pieper. Mm -hmm. Did I already talk about this? I didn't already talk about this, did I? No, you've just huh. been reusing. Oh no, I did leisure. All That's long. what I did. I yeah. felt like I had already <laughs> said Joseph Pieper this, <laughs> but I have said it this season. But it's just yes. that it was a different, different book by him. Anyway, it's so good. I just love this book. Best chapter on the Lord's Day, like I've ever read, of, mm. I would say, any book ever. So the, the theme of the book really is festivity, celebration, and ultimately worship as a component mm -hmm. of that. But I did something this time that I have not read, that I have not done in the past, which is I read it alongside Babette's Feast, which oh, actually gosh. was Abby's idea. I love that book or story, short story. Yeah. Reading them side by side was fascinating. So they're both very short. Like, yes, Babette's Feast is, Feast is really like a longer short story. Mm -hmm. And then In Tune with the World, I mean, I don't think it's even 100 pages. It's a teensy no. tiny little, it's almost a booklet instead of a book, <laughs> right? And so like reading them together, it was just so interesting to me. How many elements of what he was saying I then saw in Babette's Beast going back and forth between them. And so it was just something I highly recommend. Like, it was just so fascinating. Great read. And I feel like, I mean, I've always loved Babette's Beast. 
I read it once when I was in grad school and the book just haunted me forever. Like I didn't even have to read it again because it just so stuck in my mind. And it was something that would just come back to me in weird moments. It's just, it was one of those stories, you know? So then rereading it again with this, I felt like I just see, you know, it's a book I've been meditating on for basically 25 years. And now I see things that I didn't see before because of reading Peeper. So So I don't know, is my Scully every day in tune with the world or Babette's piece? It's hard to say. (laughs) Way to sneak in a double. (laughs) Is this cheating? (laughs) No. I mean, we make our own rules. That's right. Anyway, so I, you know, if anybody is like, well, I wonder what I should read. Two short books to finish your five by five, read them together. It'd be great. Nice. That's a great idea. Sistership is the place for homeschooling moms to talk about ideas, educational philosophy, and the practicalities of lifelong learning. While we all come from different backgrounds, traditions, states, and even countries, we are all committed to self-education, joyfully learning alongside our children, and homeschooling well for the long haul. We help one another avoid burnout by reading widely, thinking deeply, and applying faithfully. Sistership is free to join, free from ads, and most importantly, free from drama. Join thousands of thinking moms in sistership. Go to schoolaysisters.com slash sistership. Come for the conversation and stay for the fun. All right. So today is our last installment of the four-part series that I have been dragging out <laughs> for a long time now. So we've been working on this for about a year. So we've been reading and discussing Four chapters on habits from Charlotte Mason's book, School Education. So we have already done physical training, intellectual training, moral training. So today we're doing the final, which is religious training. And actually, interestingly enough, she changes the title a little bit to religious education, which I find interesting. And at the beginning, she's really, this isn't everything. This isn't all the things. Like she, I feel like she has more disclaimers around this than any of the other chapters. But I actually want us to start off with sort of like a defense of religion because (laughs) I just feel like there's this whole like, it's not a religion, it's a relationship branch of Protestantism that probably when they see something like religious training is like, let's just skip that chapter because, Mm -hmm. you know, we don't do religion here. I actually linked here. Yeah, I loved yeah. I loved reading that. That was great. The entomology behind the the online entomology dictionary. Yes. Entomological. So yeah. I no. love that dictionary. Not oh. <laughs> Etymology, not entomology. It's so- it's so hard. I can it is. <laughs> Not bugs. That's hilarious. <laughs> Etymology. Yes, you're right. Etymology. There we go. Okay. So I'm going to read it. <laughs> okay. So religion in the etymological dictionary. Apparently this comes, originated in the 1200s and was talking about monastic vows and like living this religious life, this religion centered life but then it became you know like a a word that we use right and it says it's respect for what is sacred reverence for the gods conscientiousness sense of right moral obligation fear of the gods divine service religious observance a religion a faith a mode of worship cult sanctity holiness so it just kind of goes on and on with different things but the thing i thought was interesting was actually the there's different Latin things. And actually, this was a little bit different than what I've seen before. But this whole idea of the Latin saying it's re, meaning again, like we repeat, right? So re, mm-hmm. and then legare, which means to read. So it was this idea of like we're reading something over and over again. But then oh, they're saying that they're saying later, modern writers were connecting it. And this is what I've heard before that with being bound. And so, When I looked this up before, this is interesting to me because it wasn't exactly what I had seen before. But when I had looked this up before, it was this idea of like, these are the things that keep you, They it's like you're you're tying a million strings between yourself and God. So like, so every time I go to church, it's another tie. Like you're retying these bonds between you and your God through religion. 
Mm -hmm. So there's like these formal ways of creating these ties. And so ultimately then you're bound, which has this underlying sense of obligation, right? Like, like, like you're a bond servant, which Mm -hmm. interestingly enough, scripture actually says in the Greek, because there's that word sandulas, right? Which is basically a bond servant, which is used to refer to Christians in the New Testament, I can't remember exactly where, but I had a professor in college who like really loved that word and talked about it. (laughs) (laughs) So So that reminds me of like Cindy using the word tethered. Mm -hmm. Like, so if we talk about how, how do we tether ourselves and our children or what does it mean to be untethered? Mm -hmm. It's, it's almost this similar concept it's it's religion and tradition that c- that create these connections and bonds that really anchor you. Well, that reminds me of the words to come out fount a little bit. Yeah, actually, where I'm, I'm yep. looking them up to make sure I get them right because I don't want to sing here, but that's how I remember yeah. the words. Like a better. <laughs> but yeah, right. bind yeah. my wandering heart to the. Let that grace like a fetter by my wandering heart to thee. And then it talks about being prone to wander. So the question mm-hmm. would be like, why? Why would we do this? Because we're prone to wander. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, in I mean, I, I think some of the objection is that it sounds it sounds like it sounds like work, I think, to people <laughs> or merit. I don't mean like like they're being lazy. I mean they're like doctrinally, they're like but you're not supposed to have works that merit you or whatever. So like right. in the hymn, you know, grace is tying you to the Lord, not you tying you to the Lord. I think mm-hmm. that's the objection. So then how do you defend? How do you defend religion? Right. Well, I think this is where older sources are are way more handy in having an informed opinion and informed yeah you know, practices, because I think that a huge problem is really our modern shallow thinking that really can't hold two things. And it's really, it's not contradictory at all. It's just more complex, but we want simple to mean easy and we want things to be very black and white. And so if you say, you know, you're saved by grace through faith and not by works, then we just jump quickly to, therefore, my works don't matter. And it's like, well, that's not what the Bible says. Right. Yeah. <laughs> 100%. Read through the epistles. Actually, I was just reading. I'm actually working on memorizing Titus. And Titus has like three chapters and eight times at least in the whole book. It talks about God wanting us to pursue good works and like teach people to pursue good works and teach, you know, have them abound in good works. Hmm. And and even lists actual things to do, like gives application. And so they're both true and they are not at all contradictory. They just require maybe wisdom. And I think the desire to make it simplistic can cut both ways. And I think there are groups on both sides, even today. And there have been throughout history also. Like this, it's not just new to today, right. but we have the, like usually, so piety is the older word that could mm-hmm. go with, be synonymous with religion or piety. Are, mm. Piety is the good works that we do. We walk in or with piety and it's desirable. And so then you have pietism. It's almost like there are two different ways to go about being pietistic, but pietism is the the simplistic version, the cutting out half of the equation position, where either you're cutting out the mind and doctrine part of it. So you're like, as long as I maybe have these practices. And so that, that gets more toward the like mystic or yeah. just. That's, yeah, that's very popular right now. Like practices. it is. Yeah. This is actually in John Frame's book on the history of theology and philosophy. 
at the very end, he talks about neo-orthodoxy. Yep. And that this group of people, and he names James K.A. Smith as one of the neo-orthodox people. I mean, and this was like, they have great things to say and they are countering the real issue with shallow, unhistoric, mainstream, evangelical, just happy, clappy, nothing to it, Christianity. And so you trying to get out of that, it's easy to fall into the ditch of we're going to go to these historic practices. But then it beca- it really does become, so if we do these practices, we are holy by our practices yeah. and it changes the gospel. The gospel is just do the practices and being like Christ or Christ-like or having mystic experiences. And so in in leaving shallow anti-intellectual, anti-tradition churches, they just kind of go off to a different kind of, it sounds a lot better, but it still actually is a, a shallower Christianity just the, on the opposite end. Okay. So I'm not super like privy to, this is going a different direction than you meant. <laughs> well, no, 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 not just that. This is, oh no, it's fine. It's I, actually, I find this really interesting. Kind of reminds me of the whole young, restless and reformed thing. Yeah. That was going on like 15 years ago or whatever, yeah. because, and so, Correct That's me what, if I'm wrong, but yeah. I it seems like like we have a um, rejection of religion, meaning anything that smacks of tradition, and we're just going to, quote, seek relationship, and it's usually like me and Jesus in my Bible, and some if you take it to a real extreme, you throw the whole church out because you don't even need a community. You yeah. can just like be you and your Bible or whatever. And that seems like the one extreme. And then on the other extreme, it sounds like with the neo orthodoxy and i think with the young restless and reformed what it turned out was that a lot of those leaders at least didn't actually believe any of the doctrines or at least the important ones that underpinned any of the practices so they were like adopting the externals right empty practice right but like there was no understanding and there was no idea that maybe they should agree with the why behind why people do the things that they do and so either way, you end up with this division between faith and works, really. Right. So you have right. like faith without works is dead. That is what scripture says explicitly. Mm-hmm. But works without faith is just atheism. <laughs> like yeah. it doesn't matter if it looks religious. Like how many times have we, I mean, it's really easy to point fingers at like, you know, people outside your own tradition. But what we saw within, I mean, we're, we're reformed. And what we saw was like within the reformed church is that the people that were doing that kind of thing, it was empty long term. Mm-hmm. It didn't long-term. seem that way in the beginning, but. Right. And so that's why you have to have the knowledge and the intellectual life behind your practices. Like the two are not antithetical and we need to merge our mind with our heart and our practices both and it's almost like there's getting rid of like disconnecting your relationship part with doctrine and and it's like i just need the relationship and the feelings and i don't need to know what i believe (laughs) i'm trying to think (laughs) i don't need to be connected to a broader community or understanding what's behind what we're doing or not doing. It's just like, if I have this relationship, then we're good and I don't need to worry about anything else. Or then the opposite is, as long as I'm doing these things and feeling a certain way, actually, they're both kind of about feeling, just maybe emphasizing a different kind. The mystic, like empty mysticism is like, if I am doing the right things and kind of feeling spiritual, then that's all that really matters or that's the real meaning and we don't need to yeah connect the practices to actual reality like it's it's real we have to have some basic terminology here and be clear on that and religion is one of those words that you just mm-hmm. have to understand where people are coming from and what they are packing into the word yeah and and 
often you're trying to reject something or move towards something. And we have to be willing to not remain on the surface and not stay simplistic, but keep asking why. Yeah. Well, and what do you mean by that? And until we are comfortable having those conversations or even seeking that through for ourselves, we're going to be we're going to be stuck in simplistic careening between different trends, really. That I think is a pretty good bridge, actually, to where I wanted us to start going, because Charlotte Mason, she I mean, she's going to talk about specific habits specific duties, specific ideas, but everything that comes later on in the chapter is rooted in the first few pages where she talks about authority. And, you know, anybody who's familiar with Charlotte Mason knows that she was staunch Church of England. She obviously read her Book of Common Prayer like over and over and over because she quotes it throughout her works without ever citing it. Like it's just flowing mm-hmm. out of her the way scripture flows out of her also. And that's where she draws a lot of her more religious quotes that aren't exactly scripture. It's usually something coming from the Book of Common Prayer. So, I mean, she had no idea of works taking the place of faith. Like she was firmly rooted in what she believed. And all Mm -hmm. of this is a working out of like, what is the best way really to pass on your faith to children? Because she's talking specifically about giving these certain habits to children. We can't make our children Christian, but we can do things that either support their relationship with God or undermine their relationship with God. Yeah. So she's really talking about like, what are the things that we can do as people on the outside who aren't the Holy Spirit? How do we come alongside them and help foster that relationship? And for her, that starts with authority, specifically us being under authority, which I think is, it's not just this, this spiritual feeling about God. I mean, she's talking specifically really about obedience. You know who God is and what he demands of you. And your intention is to give that to him. So she talks a lot about a sense of duty. I'm curious what you guys thought about the authority section. Obviously, you're not Church of England, so I don't even know if you agreed 100% with what she said. What do you think about these? I don't know. It's like the first three pages of the chapter. So 137 to 139. We read The Golden Key last year in Sistership together. Mm -hmm. And I felt like that was very helpful in understanding the role of authority and things like that. So, Mm -hmm. hey, I don't think I had anything that that I objected to. Partly, to me, this ties back to church membership, I would say, for in my mind. Mm -hmm. And Charlotte Mason was a member of the Church of England. Yes. And so, like, she had a duty as a member within that. And it's not like, you know, therefore anyone who was in England and was not a part of the Church of England and, you know, was the separatist or defying the Church of England, that they were wrong. Adjoining to a specific church is a significant decision and it puts you in a certain position. And it's not like that you may never deviate from or like, once you're joined to a church, it should be as hard as a divorce to get out of it kind of thing. But still, whatever church you are a part of, I do think that church membership, which I know not all, especially evangelical or like mainstream or Baptist, I guess, not all churches have church membership, but I do think that it's an important concept that we lose some of this idea of authority when we don't have church membership, Mm -hmm. because it makes the hierarchy clear. And it's actually important to this being tethered idea to know where you are in a hierarchy. And some of that, like just me and my Bible, or or just it's Christianity is just a relationship and not a religion concept is like the radical individualism that's like 
pretty much uniquely American. <laughs> that says that defies authority, uh, defies hierarchy. And if you defy hierarchy, then the only kind of authority there is is power structures, which is then Marxism. Where you Marxism, exactly. And so if we want to get out of everything's about power and out of Marxism in our culture, that's going to require us to embrace hierarchy. And I think church membership is one way to do that. And then just embracing the church that you're in where we are members has some particular practices that the church we were at before we moved did not do. And the performance of the practice in a way is a thing indifferent. Like I don't think that raising your hands during the Gloria Patri or not, or it determines whether or not you're a Christian. Okay. Actually. Yeah, these, these, <laughs> like, in one sense, you could say, they don't matter, right? right? But in another sense, it's like I'm participating in the way my church is worshiping and, and doing that is making me a part of the church. And so I'm going to embrace and accept the practices of my current church. And that's, I think, this idea of accepting authority and duty that Charlie yeah. Mason is getting at that's really it's separate from which church you're in right and even if your church doesn't have church membership I think there's still still a sense in which you become a part of the church by participating in the way that your church has set it up to participate mm -hmm. you know that's interesting it reminds me of something that Carl Truman said one time I can't remember where I heard him say it what I remember was him saying you know we're so individualistic so he said this about doctrines, the way you're saying about practices. Mm. And he was kind of like, so you join a church. So your challenge should be to find all those places where you disagree and basically like strengthen yourself to believe the parts that you don't understand mm. as a form of submission. Mm -hmm. And so he, I mean, he's like, you know, if your church is Westminster, then you need to buy in. Like if your church is Heidelberg or whatever, with three forms of unity or your church is Catholic. I mean, like he really wasn't limiting it. You should buy in. You should buy into the teaching of your church as a form of authority if you really joined it. In. And I mean, then that's been a challenge for me, right? Because like we're looking for a new church and some, some of the questions in the back of my mind have been things like, like, how much am I willing to compromise with what I believe? Right. But Truman actually would turn that around and be like, find a good church and then believe what they believe because you're joining yourself to them. It's an interesting challenge, I think. But he is getting back to that idea of authority, like what you're saying. You're going to mm -hmm. do what the people in your church do because you're a member and the church has authority over you. It's a form of submission. Right. And I think we all either have been or have seen people in church that hold themselves back from yeah. the church. And like, I remember going through the awkward stage as a, where our family was in that awkward stage as a kid because my dad was becoming reformed, but we were in a charismatic Pentecostal church. Mm -hmm. And like as his beliefs separated from the church, then that made going to church and then ask the time after awkward and difficult and then like all through the week it's like well are we going to participate in that or not and really so the separation you know we ended up leaving that church and joining a reformed church but really the separation began in the holding ourselves back because it we were forming these disagreements yeah that's kind of on the more extreme end because that is a different you know, you do get to the point sometimes where you have such a disagreement that you do need to change churches. Yeah. yeah. Oh, for That's, sure. But we can do that in just little enough things where it's not big enough to leave the church, but it's making you estranged mm -hmm. from the church by just saying, well, we're here, but not really. <laughs> Not There's really more than one way to excommunicate yourself, I think. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. 
Because you're holding, I mean, I know that technically when we talk about excommunication, we're talking about not taking the Lord's Supper. But, I mean, you can. Excluding yourself from the fellowship. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That the communion represents. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want to move us along because we've been talking <laughs> a long time about things I didn't know we were going to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> but. I guess really quickly, I'll just read, you know, she says a child cannot have, she, she's, it's really important to her that a child have a sense of duty toward God. Mm. And she believes that you are, you know, born in, well, actually we'll go into that later. So she says a child cannot have a lasting sense of duty until he is brought into contact with a supreme capital A authority who is the source of law. And the pleasing of whom converts duty into joy. So she wants them to have duty, but it's not this dreary, gray, joyless duty. She wants them to have duty the way that a knight is joyfully serving his king, right? Like, kind of like there's hierarchy instead of just power. Kind of like that. Exactly. Mm. 100%. So then on, as, as she goes on, though, she talks about, you know, like basically two things that she sees in her culture, which are undermining authority. And one of them is basically this form of higher criticism. It's happening at the uh, academic level. If you're familiar with theological history, then you know that basically it was like undermining the inerrancy of scripture by assuming a non-supernatural world. And so it would say things like, well, that couldn't have happened. Like, let's say turning water into wine at the wedding of Cana. Well, that couldn't have happened because no one could do that, right? So, like, assuming that miracles don't happen and then interpreting scripture that way. So, that's mm -hmm. one thing that's going on. I I, I mean, I'm going to assume that most of our listeners believe in the inerrancy of scripture. I don't think we need to go over that. But the other thing I thought was really interesting. So, pa on page 138, she says, There is another notion in the air which tells against the recognition of authority. And that is the greatly increased respect for individual personality and for the right of each individual to develop on the lines of his own character. Mm. So I am studying modernity with my kids this year and we are going through, right now we just finished the lecture series on Descartes, Spinoza, and Rousseau. And this is all exactly what they are saying. Mm -hmm. Really, there is yeah. no miraculous... And oh, and Kant, there is mm. the, the Bible, like Spinoza was a Jew, Jew, and he's like, no, this isn't really what happened. Kant believed certain things, but did not believe in the miraculous. And then Rousseau was completely about the individual. Uh, they all were in things, but like, you can just see their lines of thoughts. And this is exactly the fruit of it. When we were reading about Rousseau and his social contract, it was like, well, this is the the ground that was tilled for marxism hegel and and marx mm -hmm. like it's all of those things and even it's so funny you talk about hierarchy and power <laughs> rousseau's whole thing was well everyone is free to do whatever they want but sometimes they have to be forced to be free to do what they want <laughs> yes <laughs> and you can have individual opinions but you have to keep those to yourself because you have to comply with the state, like you have to be a part of the state. And if you're not, we'll force you to be. So it's for the greater good. Like it's, it's all there. It is, it wow. just, all these things. And it's been, we've been doing David, uh, Dave Raymond's modernity and I'm just watching it with the kids and taking notes and loving it. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's fabulous. Interesting. I'm watching it with my, well, one of my kids and then a couple others as well. So it's so good. And interestingly, this is actually also in Hannah's children, which again, I'm only in the fourth chapter, but she's saying that she's drawing a line between the development of individuality in the modern sense, as opposed to the pre-modern. And she uses the term expressive individualism, which for some reason I thought Carl Truman invented. <laughs> oh, interesting. <laughs> So she's so she defined expressive individualism basically like Charlotte Mason laid out right here, yeah. where it's yeah. the individual personality. And she said, though so in Hannah's children, she is saying the the shift 
in how we view children and then a low birth rate tracks with the change from seeing a marriage as a household and in the like 1700s the the founding fathers era you you look at what they're writing and saying and how they're talking about things and they talk about individual individuality she quotes de Tocqueville and he's talking about individuality but he doesn't mean this kind of single person personality as opposed to everyone else around him Mm -hmm. it's you're part of a unit and so your individuality and self-sufficiency isn't a just me on my own it's a my household and again a household has hierarchy yeah right so anyway i think she's noticing here expressive individualism working its way out into culture and saying this is gonna ruin education which it did well i mean this is basically what most gentle parenting says right where you have this whole idea of like the child is his own authority right so the way that he feels must be validated because that's his authority there's nothing else that can dictate to you how you should feel what you should do how you should act all of that kind of goes out the window at least in the more extreme forms of Mm -hmm. that that it's this rousseauian fear of treading on the child's personality which is a rejection of authority because within the context of authority as christians we say not that we that authority is intended to trample on someone but authority is created to call you to what god created you to be mm-hmm. <laughs> sometimes what god created you to be is in direct conflict with what you are being right now <laughs> <laughs> and discipline <laughs> let's see she says how authority works on page 139 so she's talking about supreme authority and then all deputized authority which was in what's the book we read i remember the golden key golden key thank you i forgot about that so she says these things work precisely as a good and just national government whose business it is to defend the liberties of the subject at all points even by checking repressing and punishing the license which interferes with the rights of others and with the true liberty of the transgressor. And she doesn't mean that in a Rousseauian sense. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) She means in the whole like, yeah, your stinky attitude (laughs) is interfering with the right of everyone else to have joy in the Lord. So you can just, you know, go to the other room for a while. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Within this context, She lists these duties and ideas that she says are born out of this concept that God has supreme authority. And then she encourages us to think about these and learn about these and then eventually impart these to our children. And these things actually precede the habits. So I'm just going to read the list and then I'd love to hear your comments on what stood out to you or what you thought of or what you would add or whatever. So she says, you know, the idea that you were born into a relationship with God, the way that you're born into your family. So she's really into this idea that you don't you don't get to choose. God made you. You are his. You're born into a Christian family. This is how it is. Mm-hmm. Duty of loyalty and then a corresponding shame of infidelity. A duty of reverence. A duty of docility, which means teachableness to indications of the divine will. An idea of God as the ruler of men. He's a benign ruler who prospers the way of his servants, but that he is the ruler an idea of how to impart a sense of defined authority in your home, an idea of reverence for holy things. That's her, that's at least the list that I built from what she writes on 139 and 140. I mean, she's saying we need to study these things and then eventually impart them to our children. And I'm curious, you know, like, how how have you done that? Or are there things that you would add to the list that you think, I mean, she says at the beginning, this isn't an exhaustive list. So if you think there's something that is really missing from this list, I'd also be curious about that. I think the thing that jumps out at me looking at the list is we can't give what we don't have. And I think that's where mm. so many are right now because, you know, Charlotte Mason was at a time where she sees these ideas being eroded, but she's still standing on the shoulders of people at an upbringing 
that held them and passed them on. And where we're at now is almost not even being able to comprehend what some of these are or mean and not seeing them in our own lives. And if we don't see them in our own lives, it's not going to work to pass them on. So it's like, are we, do we feel a duty to give reverence? Yeah. Do we have loyalty? Do we feel shame at infidelity? Or do we think that all shame is always bad and we should Mm. reject all shame? You're like, you know, are we into Brene Brown? (laughs) <laughs> and then you're not going to be able to go here. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Do we talk about God being sovereign and trusting in him when the world isn't making sense, right? Are we are we anxious about many things and not casting our cares upon the Lord? Are we worried about a lot of things? And instead of confessing that, are we just going over it and making everyone else worried about it right Mm -hmm. like anxiety is a huge problem and it's everywhere right everybody is talking about well i'm i've got anxiety about these things and it's like do we believe that god is a ruler of men and who prospers the way of his servants do we trust Mm -hmm. that god is faithful and that he blesses for a thousand generations right do we we accept you know do we believe that do we do we hold that true? I know I have a, an example I just remembered from being a kid. I remember at one point disobeying my mom and I got a spanking. And in that process, she said, the Bible says you have to obey me. So if you disobey me, you're disobeying God. And then I was disciplined and restored And, you know, it's not like a huge lecture. I think if it had been a huge lecture and like philosophical and and mom tried to defend that, you know, or like Mm -hmm. over explain it, it would have been lost. But like, I still remember I was probably five or four, (laughs) you know, but I remember my mom (laughs) saying, when you disobey me, you're disobeying God. And so then I told my kids that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I think, you know, we struggle with these ideas. So we assume our kids will struggle with them too. So we're wrestling and trying to understand, which is good. And we should, we should work through that. But they're actually just such fundamental human and true concepts that we can just, we don't have to over explain them or defend it to our kids. We can just give it to them. Yeah. And, and that's super powerful mm-hmm. or effective. That's, yeah. It's not. It's hierarchy, not power. (laughs) It's funny that you came up with a memory of your childhood because I came up with one as Abby was talking where she was talking about the anxiety. And I I was thinking about this, that I really think one of the reasons why I have, I I mean, like, I just don't struggle with anxiety, really. I really don't. I was thinking about this, like, like a mantra, my mother would repeat the verse of, well, all things work together for the the good of those who love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose. And like, I remember rolling my eyes at her as a teenager, like, oh my gosh, like this is the worst thing that's ever happened in my whole life. My <laughs> whole life is over. And here she is, all things work together. For, you know, like I, I, was, I think I even made fun of her a couple times. But yeah, I was thinking about this, that like it got into my very bones that right. like, I don't have to worry about it. It's not that I don't worry about anything in the sense of seeing my duty and the part I could play to make things better. And it's not that I think it's wrong to raise awareness when things are going wrong or anything like that. But at the end of the day, my mother repeated over and over again that we can trust God and that he works everything out for our good, that he's always working for our good and his glory. And we can trust that. Mm -hmm. And he's perfectly powerful enough to accomplish that and so i mean you're i don't know if my mother struggled with that or not but i'm thinking i never struggled with that but i think it's because it was just when you talk about authority that saying ended up having so much authority in my life because i heard it over and over every time something went wrong Mm -hmm. and by the way i do want to clarify she never said it in a way that was like trite yeah it was just a reminder it was not like a 
an empty platitude. She really believed it. Right. And the Bible really said it. So I had to believe it too. Hence mm-hmm. the authority thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's just a good reminder for all of us who maybe have children rolling their eyes at us. Mm-hmm. Like, don't let them dissuade you from continuing to say true things. They'll thank you when they're 30, as I like to say. Yeah. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Okay, so we don't have a ton of time to go into the habits the way I had originally intended, but this has been super interesting, so I'm not complaining. But I do kind I want to go through it a little bit. So she, I'm just going to read the list of habits really quick because she has six habits that she specifically lists that are born out of the principles that we just discussed. So there's the habit of the thought of God, reverent attitudes, regularity and devotions, and then she says a habit of Bible reading sort of as part of their devotions, but I would definitely say for devotions, she means regular prayer time, a habit of praise, and a habit of Sunday keeping. How have you seen these things done well? Or what interesting thing, what interesting, I don't want to say resources, that sounds kind of lame, but kind of <laughs> for people who are interested in these kinds of things and maybe don't know how to develop this. Where would you point them? Um, I think morning time is a mm. really great way to start our days. And it can add so much of these kinds of things. We would start with a simple song or a hymn, or and we would end with the doxology. We would do scripture memorization. We'd work on a passage, sometimes a psalm, sometimes in a, you know part of an epistle. And especially during that time, we had to be either standing because we would stand and sing or Mm -hmm. we were sitting reverently. There was no toys on the table. There were no drawings. This was the time that we were devoting to God. And that was just kind of a hard and fast rule. Like other points in the like when I was reading aloud or doing other things of just our our regular school books, they could have, you know, Legos or draw at the table. Like that did not bother me as long as they were paying attention. But right. Yeah. When we were doing things kind of from morning at God. Yeah. Yeah. Directed at God. We were focusing our attention as reverence. And I actually used that word. And I don't think I had read that, you know, this at the, Mm -hmm. but I knew that that was important and we weren't silly and, you know, falling on the floor, you know, like those things were just not tolerated for that time period. After that, when after we sang the doxology, we could, you know, sure, be relaxed a little bit. But that was something that was really important. Things like catechism questions and, you know, using little kind of devotional books. Theology was a really good one that we enjoyed. You know, things like that, that we would look up scripture and things like that. So I don't know. I just, uh, mm-hmm. that's kind of how we made that in. And then sometimes we would do, you know, evenings you know, as a family, praying at meals, you know, these just normal part of our lives. And even when we were, you know, eating once in a while, the reminder, um, did you pray? <laughs> you know, or asking the question is, oh, yeah, because people get hungry and mm-hmm. rush through. But yeah, just a moment. Yeah, like during morning time, we would go around and everyone would pray. So I would start, yeah. okay. but then everyone prayed aloud. And I don't like praying out loud in a group. <laughs> yeah. And I've always been uncomfortable doing that. Mm-hmm. Same. <laughs> but doing that in morning time definitely helped me. I mean, it's the kind of thing that practice helps. Uh, yeah. when, and you stop thinking about yourself and realize, oh, I'm actually just praying. And so I, the problem preventing me from being able to pray out loud in a group is I'm too aware of myself in this moment Mm. but now you know my children are adults or in adult settings and it's perfectly normal to them to pray out loud in a group Mm. and i'm grateful for that yeah and even like the habit of the thought of god is an interesting one to me it reminds me of like your story with your mom you're telling her your troubles Mm -hmm. and it's not like just a trite answer to shut it down. She's giving you encouragement straight from scripture where no matter what is going on, God is always relevant, right? Mm -hmm. And 
bringing things back to, it's not just we give a little small portion of our time to God and then we walk off and live the rest of our life like with that box checked and now we can just do our own thing. That's supposed to be like a first fruits kind of practice that then slashes out over and influences the whole rest of the day. We're, we're giving all of it to God, really. Mm-hmm. And we're living all of it before him. So it shouldn't be strange or a change of topic to weave in what God has to say about something in a conversation or to point out God's providence or protection or you know, the beauty in nature and praise God for it. That should be just springing up throughout our day in our conversation. And if it isn't, it's just something you can practice and ask, ask God to help you with and see the opportunities. And I think that's a huge part of, uh, you know, the Westminster shorter catechism says, what's the chief end of man Mm -hmm. to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Mm -hmm. It's a huge part of enjoying him. Mm Mm-hmm. That For starts sure. now, and it's it starts by being grateful, noticing and being grateful in random yeah. moments. Yeah. A couple of weeks ago, I spoke at a Charlotte Mason conference thing in Northeast Texas, and the topic, which was assigned to me, actually, I did not choose this, and I had a harder time writing my talk than I usually do because I didn't choose the topic. <laughs> it was actually ended up being super good for me to be disciplined in that way, <laughs> and but what ended up really being one of the central parts of my talk was Charlotte Mason's 20th principle, where she talks about, we allow no separation to grow up between the child's intellectual life and spiritual life. As I was thinking about that, I just really came to the conclusion of something I think I've even said here on the show before, which is that the damage that government schooling did to me was not to tell me that God did not exist. Because if it had, I would have rejected it outright because I, you know, I believed in the Lord and I was trained by my parents to believe in the Lord and all of that. But like, instead it was to just whisper in my ear constantly that he was irrelevant to what we were studying, what I was thinking about. Like he was irrelevant to most of my life, that he belonged on Sunday. And it was to just displace him to where I think I had a huge divide between my intellectual and spiritual life, not on purpose, but just it was trained how I was trained to think. And I think that's why the habit of the thought of God can be so hard for those of us who were were raised in public school, Mm -hmm. even if we were Christians and raised in Christian homes, because you were taught to spend all day divorcing God from your life and your thoughts. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think you're absolutely right that it's just a habit that we have to start giving ourselves. You already said earlier, right? We can't give what we don't have. Well, I mean, 12 plus years of government education, you may not have a habit of a thought of God for yourself. (laughs) Right. Just might not. And as a person who was converted later after Mm -hmm. college or, you know, college and things like that, that was just something that it could be developed. Like this is, this is something that we can do, right? I mean, yeah. For the Mm -hmm. longest time, I mean, I have it next to in my room still is, you know, Psalm, sorry, I have to look it up because I can't remember. Yeah. 118.24. Right. This is the day with which the Lord hath made. I will uh, rejoice and be glad in it. I, I tried to put that as my first thought when I wake up. Right. That's just one time that you can do it. And we can we can learn and form those habits because it is good. And thanks be to God mm-hmm. that he saved me. Yeah. Amen. Right? Thanks. Yep. Thanks for his grace. Right. Uh, my life was so different and I'm so thankful for that. And what is it? Restore unto me the joy of my salvation, right? Mm. And I mean, I know so many people who were raised in Christian homes, and so that was just part of their life. But, you know, we all come the same way through the atoning sacrifice of Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. The last habit that she mentions is this habit of Sunday keeping. And she does not mean going to church for an hour. She means the whole day. She thinks the whole day should be other. And she's not handing out a whole bunch of rules. Like she talks about being in nature or doing this or doing that. But like 
the idea is that Sunday for her, what does she say? It brings with it a change of thought and occupation that is healing. Mm -hmm. And so she, she truly believes in the whole day being other. And one thing I was thinking about here is that like, I mean, I don't even know that we haven't abandoned the idea of even Sunday morning being reserved for the Lord. I mean, culturally speaking, and I don't mean in non-Christian society, right? I mean, within mm-hmm. people who claim to be Christians, you know, when we talk about all of this and this acknowledgement of authority, if we can't acknowledge God's authority enough to get our children to church on Sunday morning, and if we communicate to them through our actions that your football team, your track team, your hobby is more important than being in church with God's people. Yep. I don't know how well we're going to do at getting all the other things. Like if you want your children to grow up and take your grandchildren to church, you need to take your children to church. And if you want your children to understand that they have a duty to God, then you need to tell them that God is more important than their hobbies. And you need to communicate that with what you expect of them. You know, my my son this summer was working somewhere that is open seven days a week. And I'm not going to say he never worked on Sunday because there were a couple of times where the business got their ox in a ditch. And we basically told them, well, God's word says you can go help someone get their ox out of a ditch. And I think that's what you're doing today. <laughs> so, but we were really clear to him, you are not to work on Sunday. It doesn't matter that they're open. It doesn't matter that they claim to be a Christian business and want yeah. everybody at work at 10 a.m. on Sunday morning, which doesn't make yeah. any sense to me. Because this is what we believe God teaches you. I don't think we realize how the habits that we allow are communicating to them, to the children, that they are more important than God and God's word and what God has commanded. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even in the height of lambing when everything is going crazy, we all go to church. And if there's you know, ox in the ditch metaphor, like that, they, they're, there is things that need to be done, but we all go to church and we make sure it happens. Now, we still sometimes will work on those days, but it's mm-hmm. much lighter and God is the priority and, and everybody understands that, which I really do appreciate. But yes, right. it's, it's... Which is a job taking care of animals, yes. yeah, and yeah. That's, which is very different than playing a baseball game. Yeah, and it's a very short season. We don't play baseball, and one of the reasons is is because I played competitive ball growing up, and there was a games on Sunday every single week. And now my family didn't go to church, so it didn't really matter to me. But my friend, who her family did go to church, she sometimes would miss a game, and mm-hmm. I just always appreciated that. Um, now looking back on it, and she got penalized so much for that, and I just thought how amazing that her family stood firm in that and said, yes, you can still play, but you are going to church. So, Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, we have a child who does not have a black belt in karate because the testing was on Sunday. Mm -hmm. And if we had continued where we were, it's possible that some accommodations would have eventually been made for that child by, by, by the organization. But I mean, it just, we were not going to communicate to her that karate was more important than church. Mm-hmm. Well, and having just finished Fox's Book of Martyrs, mm. it really kind of puts it in perspective on like, and mm. we are like not willing to go through inconvenience for our faith. How will we stand against persecution? If we don't want to be given a hard time or seem different or make some kind of public statement for a sport. I mean, in a lot of ways and in a lot of situations, sports is the false god of particular groups of people. Sure. And so something like, yeah, we could participate, but only at this, you know, not to compromise. It's when you put it in perspective with like Fox's Book of Martyrs, like, oh, this is actually just mm. kindergarten level and we're not ready. <laughs> we're, 
Well, we're such babies. Yeah. Well, I mean, so then, you know, we were all in states that were closed down for COVID for a really long time. Yeah. And, you know, being in Texas, I'm realizing that COVID was not the trauma here that it was <laughs> and for other people. On the left coast. Um, but I mean, I really think one of the things that I saw, and I'm assuming that you guys probably saw this too, was that the people who were kind of hit and miss on Sundays anyway, they just basically faded away from church entirely during that time. Yep. You know, they started... Yep. Some of them didn't go back. Well, yeah, that's what I mean. I mean, it was yeah. it entirely like permanently. I mean, they just kind of, you know, that, well, it's COVID, so we're going to go camping or whatever. And then pretty soon Sunday became, even if they didn't play sports, their recreation day. But I mean, it started with, they flirted with that for a long time before COVID came around, before it got hard, before the governor said you're not allowed to sing, and before we were scrambling for locations because we kept getting kicked out of facilities that thought we were breaking some sort of law by worshiping. As we were going through all of this, it was like, you know what it takes to, <laughs> to persevere during that, which was not hard compared to what our ancestors went through? Mm -hmm. If we can't even bear to miss a game then I don't know. Like, I'm just not sure we have the sticking power, which I'm sure is your point, Misty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like, how important is this really? Like, Well, on that note, <laughs> I want to thank you both for coming. This has been an interesting discussion. It took a total turn I didn't expect, which was fun. <laughs> Um, we just keep making things more and more controversial. Well, I just, <laughs> I really appreciate anytime you take us on an interesting off ramp. <laughs> that was fun. That's it for today. Thank you so much for listening and being a part of the sisterhood of the podcast. Please make sure you are following us in your favorite podcast player. If you enjoyed today's episode, share it with a friend and then discuss it with her. This is a great way to continue the conversation. All of the books and things we mentioned today are linked in our show notes. Just go to scolaysisters.com slash SS146 to check it out. Don't forget that the kickoff for our upcoming Stable and Steadfast Mentorship is on October 18th and it is free. If you are not yet in the free area of the Scully Sistership, now is the time to sign up so that you don't miss it. Just go to scullysisters.com slash join and sign up. Abby and I will return in a couple weeks with a discussion about learning disabilities and failure of nerve with Adelaide Garner. You will love this episode. Until then, we want to remind you once again that homeschooling is a marathon you needn't run alone, so open up your eyes and look around you. Find your sisters. Oh, there you are. Now I had to turn up my volume. Zoom even tells me now that I have to turn up my volume. Oh, wow. It was like, having trouble hearing? <laughs> volume. How very polite. Yeah. Was this where we bust out the praying mantis jokes? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we're going to look up religion in the entomology <laughs> dictionary. <laughs> nope, you need to delete it. I, I lost my place. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs>